The genesis of what would become known as the White Scout Car was 1935 at Aberdeen, where a Scout Car T9 was being put through its paces. It's basically a Corbett one and a half ton truck chassis, powered by a Lycoming eight cylinder engine, cranked out about 94 horsepower. Half inch armor on the front, quarter inch on the side, did about 50 miles an hour. They're very happy with it. It entered production as the Scout Car M2. 22 of these vehicles were built, and then they set about trying to improve it. The M2A1, as it was known, was very similar. What they did was they added a skate ring for three machine guns, and they changed out the engine to a Hercules six-cylinder inline. A hundred of them were built. They redesignated it as the Scout Car M3. Now, a hundred sounds like a lot for the 1930s cash-strapped U.S. Army, and indeed it was. But it was a mere blip compared to the production run of its successor. Now, the M3A1 was further improved primarily by looking at the body. They eliminated the rear doors. They widened the body to be flush with the rear wheel so you don't have that shelf anymore. And they lowered the skate mount a little bit. I've been asked to come down to the Rock Island Auction Company. They have this M3A1 here that they'll be flogging at their September premiere auction in 2018. If you're watching this a little bit later on, you missed it. And, well, sure, let's have a look and see what they've got. The manual describes the vehicle as being based off of a specially designed chassis, commercial type four-wheel drive truck. It is surmounted by a special armored body, which is mounted onto a double drop type channel section frame. Ooh, I have absolutely no idea what it means, but it's in the manual, so I'm telling you. The armor is a quarter inch everywhere, with the exception of the windshield visors, and they are a half inch. If you look to the front, you can see that the radiator is armored with uh, openable shutters. They're controlled by the observation commander, i.e. the bloke in the right seat. To the front, you'll see the standard anti-ditching roller. It's a little bit heavy. It wasn't too unusual to find, especially in foreign service, that it was removed, and they just went with a simple bumper. Unlike the very, very similar half tracks, which you, know, you can see almost the development family resemblance, the scout cars didn't seem to come with a winch option. Standard service lights behind the bush guard, marker lights as well, your blackout light. Interesting little feature down here, this little hole. Behind that is a lifting flap. That's your hand crank. If you have to hand crank the engine for whatever reason, either for maintenance purposes, let's say you're doing a compression test, or you know, just for some reason, your starter motor's dead, you have to hand start it. The engine, reasonably enough, is under the hood and it's easy enough to access, although you can only open one side at a time. That said, if you've got two people, you open them both at the same time, then you can rest the hood louvers against each other. The engine itself is incredibly simple. I mean, suck, squeeze, bang, blow, distributor, fuel pump cover, even I can maintain it. And the manual is very explicit as to how to do so as well if you're not so mechanically inclined. Now the engine is an inline six cylinder, 320 cubic inches, 110 horsepower, 241 foot pounds of torque. Six quarts of oil go into it, up at the front left here. Now the manual does reference two other engines, a Hercules diesel and a Buddha diesel. They really only got into a trial stage, a hundred of the vehicles were built and well then they decided it didn't work, they converted them back to gasoline or petrol for the rest of us. Yeah. Coolant system, nothing particularly fancy there, it's up front, radiator, 19 quarts of coolant, don't forget to open up the louvers if nobody's shooting at you to you know, aid with the cooling. Fuel system, well, it was a mechanical one when it was built, like this one. However, you wouldn't find it unusual uh, to see a electric fuel pumps being installed after the fact by restorers or collectors. The wheels, well, they are not exactly lightweight. The tires alone, with the heavy-duty tube, flap, and beadlock, that's 145 pounds. You then mount them onto 20-inch split rims. These rims, by the way, split rims, if you're not familiar with them, treat them with utmost respect if you have to work on the things. Uh, they can literally be lethal. 
Standard tire pressure, 45 at the front for the combat tire, 60 at the back. And yes, I know it says 65, but hey, I'm reading for the manual. The earliest vehicles came with a standard use tire and it was only 40 PSI. The wheels, well, they're mounted onto a very simple front axle, leaf springs, not much else to say there. Coming around to the back of the vehicle, because frankly, there's not very much around the side. As I mentioned, they got rid of the door in the back. This meant you can now festoon the back of the vehicle with camo nets, Pioneer tools, or in this case, also tripods for the two machine guns. Now, don't read too much into the fact that this particular vehicle is shown mounting two caliber 50s. The issue equipment was one caliber 50 and one caliber 30. You look down, you see the tow pintle mount there, and rather neatly integrated into the rear bumper are your tail lights. And again, just imagine how many years this particular taillight design has been in service. I mean, this is a 1939, 1940 vehicle, and yeah, you'll see this forever. Just quickly coming around to the side, you can have a look at the other side of the engine. As you can see, there's a lot of room to work on it. You'll also note that there are cloth seals or canvas seals. And you want to be a little bit careful as you're lowering the hood that you don't scrape and rip the things. This now brings us to the windshield. As, as I say, it's a half inch for the metal and the glass blocks are not particularly bulletproof. Ergo, you have the metal visors. Now, in order to get these things down, you first have to remove the glass blocks. That's done from inside. You then can lift these off the support struts and fold them down. This is not something that is done on the spur of the moment, unfortunately. Moving further back on the running boards, you're gonna see on the right hand side of the battery box. There are three screws or bolts. You simply lift off the lid and you can access your system. Now the manual states that there's supposed to be a battery on each side, but I've never seen it. So always the Pioneer tools on the far side and thus it is here. Moving a little bit further back, you can see on the uh, observation commander's door, the drop down armor. Very simple, goes up, there's a little shooter that you use to lock the thing in place. Bring it back down and use this thing as well. I don't know what you, I call it a shooter. It's drop down plunger, call it what you will. There is of course this little metal visor as well that you can use so you can see out when your armor is up. Speaking of, behind the armored door, you're gonna see the fill-up port for one of the fuel tanks. There are two 15 gallon tanks in the vehicle, one on each side with a selectable draw. So make sure you don't run out of fuel because you've got to manually transfer one fuel tank to the other. They are protected from underneath by steel plating. While I have the door open, I'll just take advantage right quick of demonstrating the operation of the radiator louvers. There are four positions selectable by this large lever on the right hand side. All the way open. And all the way closed. Getting into this vehicle is a lot easier than a lot of the vehicles that I tend to review. And uh, let's see, push down on handle, open door. All you have to worry about is the skate mount, the Terrell mount, they call it. Right, now I may not have a wonderful view to see where I'm going. Well, of course, not really. The soft top, of course, will come to here. So I, at my height, would be driving like this, and I have indeed done so in the past. I do note that they have padding on the inside of the skate mount as well. All right, but once I'm in, I mean, other than the fact that I'm half blinded by the uh, armor and the skate ring, that's nice and comfortable. Right, once you're in, as I say, I mean, it's a car, basically, or at 
large car, a small truck, it's other than the fact that you're sitting on the two fuel tanks. Nice big steering wheel, it's what you would expect. Uh, indeed, the manual states that the vehicle is steered by use of the standard type steering mechanism. Actually, I'm not really sure what else they were using back then in the late 30s. What, a tiller, maybe? It's about the only thing I can think of for, for a wheeled vehicle. And well, you have your standard array of the clutch, brake, and accelerator with your four-speed transmission, uh, reverse being all the way right and back. The windshield, as mentioned, you dismount them by use of these wing nuts, pull them both down, then you can lower the visor. I have always liked, and you'll see this on the half track as well, this particular style of uh, gauge, I guess, multifunction gauge. It's, I don't know, it adds a little bit of class to the vehicle, I think, as you're driving along with your caliber 50, so that probably also adds class now I think about it. Mm. The headlight switch, now this isn't really the one that was originally in the vehicle as it was uh, first produced. This is going to be a later modification. The original ones had a sort of an in and out with various stops, depending how far you pulled it out, that's how bright your lights were. In this one, you've got four sections. To go to blackout marker, you don't need to do anything, but to do anything beyond that, let's say you wanted to go to full service drive, you have to push this release button. It stops you accidentally knocking uh, in, as you're driving off-road at night, sneaking up on somebody, you accidentally hit it with your knee or something, and oh, look, you've just illuminated yourself in the world. As for all the controls, gadgets, and gizmos, the levers on the right, it's actually fairly simple compared to a lot of vehicles I've been in. Your transmission is a four-speed with reverse. There's a helpful panel here on the dash, just in case you forget what lever does what in which position. Handbrake, well, this is in the off position. You crank it back for on. Your transfer case is currently in low. You put it forward into neutral and then forward again into high. Now, it is possible to go straight from low to high while on the move, but the manual recommends that you stop first. The vehicle will mechanically top out at 55 and a half miles an hour, although the maximum allowable speed was 45. In reverse, top speed was 10. That's in high range. In low range forwards, you'll top out at about 30. This is, of course, a scout car, and there's not very much point in doing any scouting if you haven't told anybody what it is that you have scouted. As a result, behind the driver or observation commander, you could place, if you wished, a radio such as this one. The alternative would be additional munitions, but really the radio is more important. The standard layout for the rear of one of these cars was six seats. And they would be mounted two outboard at the rear corners, two outboard just behind the driver and observation commander. And the last two would be mounted in the middle facing to the rear. Now in this particular vehicle, we have a spare tire mounted, which sort of intrudes onto where the fixed seat would be for the six man. So instead they just have some dismantable cushions. It's kind of interesting. They've actually built a specific footwell for these guys in the middle. As mentioned, the standard weapons fit is one caliber 30 and one caliber 50, but uh, standard and in the field don't necessarily see eye to eye. Thus, it wouldn't be unusual to find multiple machine guns festooned around one of these things. Ammunition, well, there's actually not a lot of space for it. These boxes in here look nice and capacious, but bear in mind, they are substantially covered by the wheel arches. The skate mount is easy enough to use. There's a large handle here, you lift up, it releases the brake, and if it was free rolling, I might have to hit this with a hammer or something, uh, you can slide it around the vehicle. There is also a cant corrector. So for the part of the skate mount, which is a little bit of an angle by the drivers, you just use this crank here and it'll level out the machine gun if that happens to affect your aim. Getting out is fun. The vehicle was never quite as good as the half-track which followed it, but still 20,894 of them were built. Of that lot, about 11,400 were sent as lend-lease to friendly foreign nations. 
and they would continue to see service around the world for many years afterwards, in common with a lot of American World War II vehicles. These days, a common source for collectors is actually Greece. Uh, it was kept in service surprisingly long, and a lot of modifications were made as well. So if you do get one of these ex-Greek ones, just see what you need to do to backdate it. If you've got one that has the automatic transmission, that might be a little bit more work, though. Now, I am occasionally asked, do I personally, the chieftain, own an armored vehicle? And the answer is, of course not. I live in San Francisco. I can't afford one, and even if I could, where the devil would I park it? However, were I to get started on buying armored vehicles, this is actually pretty much where I would start. Because, as I said, even I can maintain it. It's pretty simple. And it looks the part. I mean, this is the sort of thing you can have a lot of fun commuting and traffic in, or just taking it down to hot August nights and showing it off at your local show. So, if anybody does feel generous enough to happen to want to donate me a military vehicle, I'm not going to be too picky, but hint, hint. I think it's a great starter vehicle, together with ferrets and a few other ones, but if you want iconic American armor, this is a very good start. So it'll be interesting to see what this particular vehicle goes for at the auction. I'll be sure to come back and edit the description in a few weeks and let you know what the sales price was. Anyway, that was the tour of the M3A1 Scout car. As ever, I hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll see you on the next one. And you almost wonder if it's worth driving head up as opposed to down like this, but I actually did that thing on a Dodge Viper once I had to do that. And certainly with the Alfa Romeo, that, that convertible Alfa Romeo, I had to drive like this. It was absolutely insane. Anyway, so let's note see. the Marco Lightner. Now I can look forward. Is that a hand crank? It is just a hand crank. I'll be damned. Max is out at 55 and a half miles an hour. And in low range, well, you're really close to doing to 25. I just made that shit up. 30.